Again, welcome everyone to the PhD in the Netherlands Online Series. My name is Amit Mitasari as the moderator of today's session. I'm from Nufik Southeast Asia. Um, before we start, uh, as you all know that we have a special guest from University of Groningen, uh, Campus Friesland. Um, and we are going to learn more about uh, how uh, as a PhD candidate or um, yeah, as a researcher to conduct their research in the Netherlands. Uh, but before we start with our main uh, program, I uh, would like to give you a bit more information regarding our organization. For those, you, for those of you who don't know yet with Nufik Southeast Asia, uh, we are formerly known as Nufik Neso Indonesia. Uh, our uh, office is... Um, located in The Hague, the Netherlands, and we have uh, representative offices around the world and one of them in Indonesia. So we are a Dutch organization um, in the field of uh, education and research, but we also independent and non-profit, and we are funded by the Dutch government through the Dutch Ministry of uh, Education, Culture, and Science. Uh, these are our uh, current main activities that we do uh, to facilitate NL knowledge where we collaborate with different kinds of institutions in the field of education in Indonesia and the Netherlands, but also in Southeast Asia right now. Um, we also support internationalization of education where we promote study in the Netherlands through um, prospective students in Southeast Asia. Uh, where we also provide a lot of information as well as um, give presentations such as like this. Uh, other than that, we also pro uh, manage uh, scholarship programs um, and then we also promote study in Indonesia uh, where we support outgoing mobility in Indonesia to Dutch uh, students. And lastly, we also connect and support Netherlands uh, knowledge community where we invite all of the alumni or those who have or had uh, lived in the Netherlands and came back to their uh, country, to Indonesia, for example. And then we uh, organize a lot of events, uh, workshops, and so on. So that's about it, about um, uh, our organization. But now I uh, would like to give you or provide you a little bit more information regarding PhD in the Netherlands. Uh, if this is the first time you are uh, joining uh, our session, um, I'm going to give you a bit more information that PhD in the Netherlands is um, in the form of contract um, with the Dutch institutions. So it means that you uh, have to find a research uh, job position in the Netherlands. But that's not uh, only uh, the, the one way to do that because you can also um, uh, see or contact the uh, research universities or in institutions that provide a PhD program to find, uh, yeah, or to pitch your own research proposal. So you have two ways uh, to, to conduct your PhD uh, program in the Netherlands. Um, basically, uh, in the Netherlands, you will have to conduct your PhD for a minimum of four years, but it, it always depends on your uh, research, um, uh, on how many years you, you will have to, to, do, to do your program. Uh, other than that, uh, where you can do the, uh, the PhD program, uh, the, the PhD program is offered in... Uh, at least 13 research universities, but also uh, institutions uh, such as IHE, uh, Delft uh, for water uh, institution, uh, and also other institutions that are actually uh, cooperate with other research uh, universities. Uh, for more information, uh, you'll find a, a research job board's websites uh, there uh, on the slides where you can find more information regarding PhD and then Netherlands. Uh, on the next slide, um, sometimes people ask, uh, what are the criteria uh, for you as a candidate to apply for a PhD program? So here are uh, three main uh, criteria where you have to 
uh, uh, generally have a strong background in research yeah so you do have a similar uh, background or linear program as your uh, master degree but also if you can uh, provide uh, a strong uh, experience within the research and uh, in that particular field you, you may also be uh, yeah employed or uh, be hired for, for the job positions that you're applying for uh, you do have a uh, have to have a master's degree and you have to have an excellent uh, good comment of uh, English because the entire of your research, you will be using English as your main uh, language. And then there are three ways to fund your PhD program. If you uh, uh, didn't apply through a job position at the university or for example, academic transfer, which I will uh, tell you a, bit, a little bit more about that. But here, three, uh, the first one uh, is employed by the PhD awarding institutions. So such as, for example, uh, our speakers today is actually, um, uh, yeah, uh, was provided the, the funding from University of Groningen. So that's possible. And then the second one is a fellowship or a grant awarded by the supporting body. So for example, from the Indonesian government, there are uh, ample opportunities for you to apply, for example, LPDP, and then there's also a scholarship provided by the Ministry of Religion Affairs, for example. And then lastly, uh, you can also get sponsorship from your employer. So if, for example, if you're in academia, you can uh, apply for a scholarship program uh, through your campus if that's uh, applicable to you. And then uh, for tuition fees, it's not uh, really mandatory because uh, normally PhD uh, doesn't have any tuition fees but uh, some do provide tuition fees uh, charges for, for you so it is very base-to-base uh, -base, uh, cases so you really need to consult with the university that you're applying for. Um, on the right side of the slide you'll see a preview of the academic transfer which is a website where you can find all of the PhD uh, position database where you can just search like a Google, uh, type in your uh, field of your interest, and then you can find a lot of uh, positions available at the uh, institutions in the Netherlands. So you can just go uh, check out uh, www.academictransfer.com. So um, before we start, I would like to uh, already uh, give you information regarding the PhD recruitment, which is uh, the upcoming event that we are collaborating with Academic Transfer, uh, supported by the Embassy of um, Kindergarten of, of the Netherlands in Jakarta. Uh, it's going to be held on the 7th uh, of October in 2023. So um, in this event, uh, you... Uh, as a candidate, you can apply for a uh, application in the uh, the website of the academic transfer, and then you can uh, present the best uh, profile uh, of your CV and then your uh, research if you already have it. And then the delegates who are participating in this uh, event will um, do uh, assessment and select which candidate will be invited to this event. So it's a one-on-one inter -on -one interview with the uh, Dutch uh, delegations, and then uh, it will give you uh, opportunity uh, to, to be hired by the university or even uh, have a pot potential uh, research collaboration. But uh, the, the main uh, thing that I would like to inform you is that uh, they are focusing on candidates who are already having a um, uh, funding for a PhD, but uh, don't worry, uh, we are still encourage you to apply to this event because uh, during your interview, you'll have uh, plenty of time to um, discuss about your PhD funding as well. And uh, lastly, um, we have a a uh, winner program where uh, we invite all of the Indonesians but also Dutch audience to uh, participate in this uh, event. 
uh, and then uh, it's uh, the week of Indonesia Netherlands Education and uh, Research where we celebrate a bilateral um, a relationship with, between Indonesia and the Netherlands in the field of uh, education and research. So if you do feel uh, interested in this event, uh, feel free to register to the event. Okay, so I hope everyone is uh, really uh, feel informed already about that. Um, okay, so before we start, I'd like to give you uh, information first about our speaker. Uh, as you all know that we are inviting uh, Eko Rahmadian. Uh, he is a PhD researcher from the University of Groningen uh, Campus Friesland. Uh, who is currently doing uh, research uh, for the Department of Governance and Innovation. But um, we will receive more information from him. So I would like to invite uh, Mas Eko to the stage. And then we will discuss more about the, um, yeah, the research uh, journey that he's been doing uh, currently. So hi, Mas Eko, how are you doing? Hello, baby. Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing good as well. Uh, thank you very much for um uh, being here and be our uh, guest speaker right now. So um, Maseko will uh provide you with um presentation and then we will uh continue with a Q and A session in the end and then where everyone can uh, ask questions through the Q and A but also through uh microphone if you if you'd like to. So Maseko, please feel free to start and then uh, we'll see you again during the Q and A. Thank you very much. Let me try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Good uh, afternoon, allemaal. Good evening, everyone in Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, and good afternoon here from the Netherlands. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for your willingness to attend this presentation today. I know it's almost weekend in Jakarta, in Southeast Asia, but you are still here uh, to listen some sharing from me uh, about the PhD in Netherlands, especially in the uh, University of Groningen or Campus Friesland. So probably some of um, the points that I will discuss today, you've already known, but if it's not, um, if there are some points that you've known already, I apologize for that, but hopefully I can give you a little bit more new insight. So I will start with a brief introduction and then a little bit personal reason why I do the PhD, maybe certain checklist application and what's the tips for the interview and maybe one of the interesting one is a house life as a PhD student. So briefly, uh, shortly telling, my name is Eko, Eko Rahmadian. So now I'm doing my research on governing the use of big data and digital technology for sustainable tourism. I just uh, end my four year PhD contract uh, last month. So hopefully now I'm finalizing my thesis and I will submit my thesis in the next uh, one or two weeks. So wish me luck. Hopefully if everything goes well, then I will be having the defense by the end of this year. So um, I'm from Governance and Innovation Department in uh, at Campus Friesland uh, in Hrani in Lewarden. And back at home, I work at Statistic Indonesia or Burden Pusat Statistic. I've been working for Statistic Indonesia since 2007. And starting last week, I have a new role as a member of the UN Big Data Task Team on mobile positioning data. Thanks to the PhD, I have more opportunity not only to contribute to my country, Indonesia, after my PhD, but also to contribute to uh, the bigger or larger community in the international level. Um, so I will take you to visit my, my city, Leowarden. So the pictures on the right, that's the city where I live, that's uh, Leowarden, and the other two photos are in Groningen. So Campus Friesland is the youngest uh, faculty and the only faculty outside the city of Groningen. So Leowarden is a different city. Um, if you take a train, it's only like 15 minutes by train. So I live in Leowarden, but I visit Groningen quite um, many times because I did have a lot of classes and courses and conferences in Groningen. Um, Groningen itself, or University of Groningen, is the second oldest university in the Netherlands. The first one is um, Leiden University. So if you decide to study in at Campus Friesland, then you, you, you may choose. You, you may choose to live in Leeuwarden 
or you may choose to live in Groningen. So it's 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 really flexible actually. Why I do the PhD? So I have certain reasons to do the PhD. I did my master degree back in 2012 in uh, in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands also, at Erasmus University of Rotterdam. And I was very impressed with everything that I've received during the master degree. It's only one year, but it gave me a lot of uh, experiences, knowledge, and also uh, impressions. Uh, so starting that time when I was thinking, if I want to do the PhD, then it should be back to the Netherlands. I don't know why. So. I did try to apply to certain countries as well, Australia or but Germany, uh, but um, I, I didn't. I didn't really full or put my heart when I did the applications, and I, it didn't well. It didn't go very well. I did go to the the interview, but uh, the interview was not uh, running very well. But then, um, yeah, I have a passion on doing the research, so that's the big the biggest reason why I want to do the PhD again. I want to have uh, better experiences, better networking in international level, and Netherlands is uh, one of the best uh, place to gain that. I also have a passion on sustainability because back in 2019, I remember the terms of sustainability is just a term. For now, I think everyone knows what, what is sustainability. But back in 2019, four years ago, it's, it's just a term, and then I really want to know how to really implement sustainability, not only during the research, but also implement uh, to the, the real life. So I would like to share you one of my experience when I just started my PhD. I remember that time, I just started my PhD one month, and then um, I was very fully motivated. I print out a lot of papers and a lot of reading papers to read. Uh, I went to the uh, printing stations and then I printed like almost 50 papers at a time. One of my friends was looking at me and he asked me a question. Hey, Eko, what are you doing? Uh, and I said like, hey, I'm printing these papers for my reading. I was very motivated at the time, and then he asked me one question: Do you do you know or do you uh, how do you ever concern how many woods, how many forests has to be sacrificed for you to uh, print that much? It hit it hit me really really bad at the time. I mean, like now I realize that sustainability is not only just word, it's not just only theory, but really people here really implement sustainability in their daily life. If you go to the Netherlands, you will experience a lot of maybe let's say small things like this. Uh, for example, like when I do the research on sustainable tourism, okay, what is sustainable tourism? When I do traveling, am I a responsible tourist? Am I care about the environment? Am I care, uh, do I care with the, let's say local business? Do I care about the electricity that I use? Do I care about the water that I use? So it's all about implementing what I've learned to the real life and hopefully try to make impact, even though it's not that big, but just small impact is, is okay. Am I satisfied so far? Uh, absolutely, yes. I'm very thankful with these uh, whole experiences, the research and everything and experience that I have during my study so far. So how everything began. So I start my journey as a PhD in the Netherlands from actually PhD recruitment day back in 2018. So it was the first time uh, Nufik Neso Indonesia have the PhD recruitment day uh, back in 2018. Um, I think I got the information around August 2018 and then the application is uh, within two months. And then the interview was on November 2018. Um, many uh, professors, many universities came to Jakarta, came to Indonesia. You could see the list from the website of Nufik Neso Indonesia at the time, and now it's Nufik C, Southeast Asia. There are lists of professors, there are lists of universities with their expertise and where, uh, where they are coming from. So at the time, uh, we had to submit the CV, we had to submit motivation statement, we had to submit short proposal and transcript and IELTS score. So um, it's not a very complete application, but it's like pre preliminary um, uh, application, let's say. Um, I remember that I applied to four universities or four professors at the time. I could not remember uh, the name of the university or professor, but I received like six interviews for the PhD recruitment day. So it was really memorable moment for me and also a little bit, you know, like a lot of works as well, because within one day, 9 November 2018, from morning to afternoon, I had to do these uh, six interviews with four professors and two different persons from HR of university. So why did I get extra in, uh, interview? Because the professor who could not come to Indonesia, they checked my, uh, let's say my CV, 
um, or my background. And then they asked the HR to invite me for the interview because they have some project in the Netherlands and they want to know more about me, something like that. So, um, so yeah, it's quite a, it's what it's like what I said, it's quite a memorable, memorable day because uh, six interviews within one day. Um, of course, each interview runs differently. Uh, so some of them very successful. I mean, very successful means like I can show, I mean, like I can be very convenient with my idea. And it does, it didn't feel like it's an interview. It even more feels like discussion. We discuss about method. We discuss about the research method, the topic that I brought to the to the table at the time. Um, the other two also, they it's it's all about myself, it's all it's all about me, and then what's my plan in the future, and they talked about the, the project from the professor back in the Netherlands. And even they invited me to come to the Netherlands to work. Uh, they they didn't call it a pre PhD, but they invited to go to the Netherlands to uh, to work for the proposal for two or three months, and then uh, to to write a very full proposal for the PhD application at the time. So uh, six uh, six interviews, and then what I did after that, I didn't wait too long. I I did try to make um, a follow up one by one. So I I respond everything and then I submit a full application. I revise my proposal because at the time it was a short application, it's short proposal, research proposal, and then I did make some extensions, make it more comprehensive, make it more details, make it more rich, make it more um, you know like the quality. I have to improve based on the interview. Um, uh, what is it? The, the, the interview on 9th of November. Did I secure the funding at the time? No, I didn't secure the funding at the time because um, it's all about because they suggest me to um, to uh, to submit the applications um, after the interview. But then after the follow up, I got certain feedback. I got few LOAs. I got also the invitation to come to the Netherlands. And a few months later, Campus Friesland, University of Groningen. Uh, luckily, they opened two vacancies for the PhD, and they offered me one of the positions. So that's how I got the position for uh, the for the PhD in the Netherlands uh, as an employer at the University of Groningen. So maybe my suggestion is, uh, if you go to the interview for any uh, opportunities like PhD recommend day, uh, just do our best because we don't know what's going to happen in the future, and just try to put out all our heart and our passions during the interview. And Bemi also uh, mentioned already about academic transfer. This is, uh, you can really see almost all the PhD faculties that is available in the Netherlands. Um, you could also um, signing in and also subscribe and then uh, get the email alert from the, the academic transfer for the opening uh, job vacancy in the Netherlands. I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, PhD vacancies in University of Groningen, you could also check our website, University of Groningen, and then you can see the current PhD vacancies because in Groningen there are 12 or 13 faculties and then maybe it's going to be a homework if you check one by one of the faculty, but if you go to this website or this menu, then you can check the full PhD opportunities um, uh, that, that is being opened in Groningen. And also I'd like to tell you another, uh, what is it like, uh, let's say, um, uh, opportunity as well. Starting last year, there are four new schools at University of Groningen. What is school? School is like a collaboration of certain graduate school, and they have four teams working together, and they're doing research, education, and etc. So we have Aleta Jacob Schools of Public Health, Gentina Tem School of Digital Society, Technology, and AI, Rudolf Agricola School for Sustainable Development, and Wubo Oka School for Energy of Climate. So four big schools, four new schools, and they have many opportunities of vacancy open almost every year. So around 15 or 20 or even 40 PhD vacancies are being open almost every year. So if you're interested to apply uh, for a job or PhD vacancy within these, three, these four schools, you can check the website, um, each of them. Or if you already have some funding, for example, and you want to find the supervisor or promoter that fits with your field, public health, digital society, sustainable development, energy and climate, then you can check these uh, schools and then maybe you can start the communication with the supervisors or your potential promoter. So what's the checklist application? Actually, it's, it's, it's quite standard. Maybe if you already prepare your PhD application, you've known already, uh, of course, CV, motivation statement, reference letter, 
research proposal, IELTS or TOEFL, and also your transcript. Um, because I just know it now when I start doing the PhD, that PhD is like the first stage in academia career. So academia in uh, academia career is like starting by the PhD and then postdoc and then assistant professor and then associate professor and then you become a professor. But of course, it's not always happen like that. Like 60% or 50% 50, 50 of the PhD, they are working at the end outside academia. For example, like I work for the government or industry. So the most important thing uh, when you want to apply for the PhD make a very good and strong research proposal then um well, what is what is the type what is what is the benefit what is the novelty how strong is the methodology and what is the contribution of your research to the current academia can you fill the research gap that is existing in academia at this moment so for me in the beginning it's a little bit a shock because i was working in technocrat for years already and then back to the academia uh, perspective, it's a little bit challenging. And um, I have to put um, so much effort to really adjust and to create or to write a good proposal on doing this PhD. So I would like to suggest you, sorry, to create like, make a plan, like step-by-step -step preparation. First of all, step one, please try to identify what is your passion? What is your research focus? Because a PhD is for your study, and then it's it's not always easy. So if you're doing something which is not your passion at all, then it's going to be very tricky. So identify what's your passion, what you want to do, what you really want to analyze, what's your research all about, and then try to identify the potential university and potential supervisor in the field that can help you to do your research, and what's your potential funding? So my Abby already mentioned there are three uh, certain uh, fundings available from university, maybe from external scholarship, maybe from grants, and maybe from your employer also provide some sorry some uh, some funding. And step two, start to write the research proposal. It's important because um, I did once involved in a PhD selection committee. And then I could see during the interview, everything they ask, mostly all about your research proposal. And based on my own experience, few interviews, it's all about the methodology, the proposal, the problems that you try to solve. That's actually what the interview mostly all about. And then you start to develop the strategies if you want to apply for some grants, if you for sorry, I mean like scholarship, if you want to apply for the job vacancy, start to develop your strategy, plan your action, measure the progress. So if you fail, it's okay, keep trying and then learn from the failures because it's uh, it's okay to fail one, two times, three times uh, being rejected, but then you learn, we learn from the mistakes what we can improve. For example, like I learned from my previous experiences um, when I did apply for Australia, for example, I just submit my application because the deadline is almost close. So, okay, let me try, let's give it a shot but I didn't really prepare the methodology very well. I didn't really know what I want to do actually. So um, then the result was clear. Um, I was rejected. I didn't make it to the interview. And then I, I did apply for a, a university in Germany. I did go to the interview, but then some um, non-technical things happened. I was in Singapore at the moment. And then um, it's about the, what is it, internet connection, whatever. So it really affect me mentally because I supposed to have the interview, but then uh, it was not running very well. Then, um, okay, then if I have to do some interview online, I has I have to have a very good stable connection in the proper place and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So learn step by step from the mistakes and keep improving because at the end, if you are keep moving and keep working and probably the light is there and keep focusing on the future. And if you pass the administrative uh, selections, go to the interview, uh, uh, what is it like the interview um, invitations, congratulations, you are one step closer. So again, try to review your research proposal, review your motivation statement, and read then uh, prepare your proper literatures because probably you will face few professors and they will ask you around those uh, area and it's it will be nice if you know your future supervisor what uh, what is their expertise and you read some of their papers you read some of their works and then you could imagine like okay probably she will ask me something about this topic 
and be enthusiastic, uh, show that you're passionate about it and be confident, but also keep be yourself. I think it's important. Um, when I did an interview, I just say, what's my flow? What's my weakness? And I just be honest with that. For example, like, okay, I want to develop these variables, but I have no idea for now. I have no, I have less skill to develop this technique, for example. And then my supervisor said, or the interviewer said like, hey, Echo, don't worry about that. It's a good topic. You have a few years to study about this technique. So it's, it, I didn't really expect that kind of answer, actually. So, so yeah, so try to be more realistic. But then I'm mean, like, if, if I don't know something, you don't know about something, just, just, just uh, tell it honestly, rather than to create something uh, not clear, for example. All right, and then congratulations, you've got, uh, what is it like? You've got a chance to be a PhD and you've been accepted. You, the visa, usually the PhD uh, program, um, the visa will be managed by the university. So it's much, uh, it's really, really helpful from the university, everything. You have to submit some documents, but then mostly the visa procedures will be started from the university, from the international network. And what is life as a PhD student about? So it looks like, okay, put the name as a PhD candidate or PhD researcher, but but it's it's not as beautiful as it looks like, actually. So of course, within four years, there's a lot of things happening. You know what? I have to revise my research proposal almost completely different than what I did apply from the beginning. Still the same topic, but the techniques was different. Why is it happened? Because when I came here, then I will meet the new team of supervisors and they have different expertise. They have different expectations. They have different opinions. And then, of course, it's about academia. It's, it's not static. It's a very, what is it like? It's very flexible. So one thing that we have to keep in mind when we do the PhD, Try to be very flexible because changing ideas or changing techniques or changing methodology or changing direction that is uh, that is okay that is okay but hopefully it happened not in the third or fourth year so make sure you are hit and you know like you do you do those kind of changes in the first or second year because that's that's very fundamental for your uh, for the the next uh, the next years and then within three months I have to revise uh, the new and create a new proposal. And then we have a, a training and supervision plan and attend some classes, attend some research. Um, of course, you're doing research and attend some workshop. And attending classes, courses, and workshop, it really helps me, myself, to really see things more clear. I got no knowledge, and then now I know what I want to do and what kind of direction and what I have to do. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it works. Because I remember one time the PhD, my supervisor saying that the end result of the PhD is not the thesis. The end result is you as a PhD researcher. So uh, I want to see you to grow. I want to see you to improve within these four years. So at the end, after the PhD, you can be a, an independent researcher. So after one year, we have a go no -go interview. We call it go no -go interview. So uh, I, I think the interview was almost uh, two hours with the supervisors and also sometimes attended by the graduate school. And then they will uh, determine whether we can continue our PhD or not. So that's that's quite uh, that's quite uh, stressful. And then uh, the annual every year we also have um, uh, R and D or research research and development interview every year. Basically, the question is the same with the go no go interview. So they really want to see your progress. They want to see how you grow, how you solve the problems, what's your uh, what's your products, what I mean like what's your achievements, what's your academic output. Because for me. Uh, my PhD thesis or dissertation, mostly we call it PhD thesis, is uh, a paper base. So my dissertation should be at least uh, four articles and to have to go for the defense, at least two of them already published and two of them already sent out for publication because the publication process takes quite a little bit of time. Um, so yeah, so um, it's it's quite it's quite sometimes in the beginning can I make it? But again, uh, the supervisor they are not um, not to judge you, but they are there, they are here to help you. So if you have any problems, what I learned based on my experience, any problems, don't keep it until late. Just come to them as soon as possible, and they will help you to grow. Um, I also had an experience for teaching, supervising, and also self development. Also. Uh, 
chances for networking, attend international conferences, winter school, summer school. Uh, I tried also to apply some grants and thankfully I got a grants in 2020. It's not that big, but it helps my research and also opportunity for research collaborations because uh, the opportunity or the advantage of studying in the Netherlands, the University of Groningen, for example, you are working with one of the best people in the field, um, in the country or even in international level. They have networking when they are, have some activities, sometimes they invite you to join them. So that's, that's kind of a big opportunity. For example, like a few months, few months ago, um, my supervisor or my promoter was in Switzerland and then he made a call, uh, he called me and Hey Echo, there is a workshop here. We talk about digital twin. Can you make it to come here and give the presentation? And then, you know, I mean, like, if it's not because of him, I won't be there to pretend or to present in one of the best um, university in uh, in Europe or in the world. Um, and again, I was very thankful to be accepted as a PhD uh, student here at Campus Friesland with the opportunity. So I try my best to uh, to to be graduated. Um, on time for a year. So what I did uh, was I made a Gantt chart in almost everything, uh, time schedule for my thesis, for my activity. So make a big activity and also make a small task list and also the deadline of everything and keep evaluating them by weekly or monthly basis. So uh, as I told you before that there's many things that uh, you are doing during the PhD. And of course, uh, it's a mixed feeling. It's not always uh, positive. It's always it also could be very negative. For example, like I felt I received negative feedback many many times because the Dutch people very straightforward, very uh, you know straight to the point. And sometimes for Asian people, it's like oh, it's it's what I learned is that it's not something personal. You know, it's this is this is what it is. They want us to grow. They want us to be better. So this kind of perspective, like I try to learn a lot. So how to manage negative feedback and turn it into something positive. That's what I learned, of course. Uh, rejection, of course, not all well, paper you send to the conference or to the papers will be accepted. Uh, some of them also rejected. And then how to manage this rejection also important. And then analyze why it's becoming rejected. Um, failure sometimes, for example, like you've written uh, a, a paper and then suddenly maybe uh, it got negative feedback and says like, oh, this is not good enough. Can you write another one? Well, it's, uh, it is what it is. And thankfully I didn't achieve, I didn't achieve or I didn't get burned out because I tried to make everything balanced. Even though COVID happened, COVID was, was so that's, that's really horrendous moment actually with the COVID, but, but we are being together. We try to uh, support and help each other. Uh, so the positive feeling, of course, when you get the publication, get published, it's great. Unlock the new skills, you get opportunities. If your project is successful, it gets uh, some acknowledgement and then also many more experiences. So if you're accepted as a PhD student, uh, maybe three things that I would like to suggest to you. Uh, keep your life balanced. It sounds cliche, it sounds classic, but it is real. So work-life balance. In my first year, I, in the weekend, I always went to the library. I work out. I work um, on my paper. I didn't take a holiday and until I got an email from HR for university. We noticed you, and then they said, like, we noticed you haven't taken any holiday. Please take some holidays because it's important for your mental health. I never received any kind of emails like that before in my life. So it really impressed me, like, oh, okay. And then like, okay, let's take some holiday. Let's go take a two weeks somewhere. Uh, was it work? Then, yes, I I experienced it after took some holiday or day off. I mean, like, sorry for saying this, maybe all of you already experienced that, but at the time, 2019, 2020, I just realized taking holiday is important because once you're back, you have more productive, you're more fresh, and then you can come out with different and fresh ideas. So work-life balance is important. Time management is really important because you have a lot of stuff to do. Sometimes they, you have something outside your, um, you know, your um, your task, and then uh, they ask you to do this, to do that. Um, sure, but then you have to manage everything very well. And time management is very important. And stress management is also important. Uh, we almost finished for my presentation. So not only at the campus, we also have this organization for the PhD um, students. 
So it's organized by uh, Gopher, Groningen, Groningen Organization for PhD Education and Recreation. If you could see on the photo, in December or on September, they will have some events like how to print the thesis and a workshop about perfectionism and also a workshop about to make a cocktail and then stress management workshop and what about postdocs. So there are many uh, variety or many activities that you can uh, attend so to improve your knowledge or maybe just networking or to find new friends or learn how to make a cocktail for example and try to make it without alcohol which is sometimes very difficult and stress management I mean like we have because uh, because I have to tell you that in at the university we have a psycholog a psycholog I think two or three people so if you have any problems with uh, with study and everything, you can always reach out to them and everything is confidential. So don't worry about that. Um, also, there is a communication called MindMint. So if you want to communicate your research to general public or specific audience, uh, you can reach out to them and they will give you some preparation or some tips to do some uh, communication. So to, um, to close my presentation, please invest your time regularly. What I did was I work on the weekend on my uh, research proposal and try my best to improve uh, every time. I know all of us are very busy and there's a lot of things that you have to prepare. But then if we want to make it through, I think it's very important to invest our time uh, regularly. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And please feel free if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maseko, for very insight insightful and extensive presentations. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know what to, where to start. <laughs> A lot of to discuss because uh, you've mentioned already regarding your um, journey from the start, from you started your um, uh, application to, to the PhD uh, recruitment and then how you eventually um, got the opportunity uh, to be invited to the interviews, a lot of interviews uh, on that uh, one day, and then you finally got invited. Uh, the, the outcomes, you get uh, many invitations from the universities, and then you finally got invited by the Campus Friesland uh, to apply for a, a job position there. Um, let's see. Uh, Maybe we can just jump right into the questions because I see here uh, some people asking about uh, also uh, question pub publications, uh, whether it is important uh, for a PhD candidate uh, to start their paper or to, to have a lot of publications before applying, but also during uh, your PhD uh, research, whether it's important to do a lot of publications as well, because you mentioned that during your PhD, you have to, to write, for example, four articles, and if I'm not mistaken, two publications uh, within your um, contract, I guess. So yeah. maybe we, we can start from, from those, those questions. Is it really okay. important, Masetko, to, to write your own publication before applying for a PhD? Ooh, good In question. your experience, maybe. My experience, I was very thankful I did have the master thesis. This, uh, master thesis. I think uh, I didn't have a lot of publication. I did attend some conferences, but I didn't have a lot of um, like papers in the journal. So when they asked me academic output, of course they will ask. And I could see that from the experiences, from the when I was here as a committee, they will check if you have experiences on publishing a paper. Mm. But again, uh, it will it, it will be an extra bonus if you have uh, some. But based on my experience, I only have uh, this thesis, and thankfully my thesis was one of the best at the time when I graduate. So I could mention like one of the best thesis when I graduate. So probably oh, it helps. Oh wow. Okay. Um it's not that perfect, but I was I don't know. It's like I just I just mentioned uh this paper was one of uh the best thesis of the year. Mm -hmm. Um I didn't I didn't have other publications at the time because I mean like of course I didn't work in academia. I mean like it's not an excuse but I just realized when I did apply for the PhD, like, oh, shoot, I didn't have this <laughs> bunch of papers. Mm -hmm. But keep going because mostly um, they're asking about our research proposal. So in during the interview, they will ask a lot about this uh, proposal, your research, what you want to bring. 
And then how do you plan to do this? Well, how do you, I think it will be nice if you know how to split this, your research proposal within four years, just not pretend, but imagine you're working in four years and you have this topic and how you divided this into four years. So well, first year I'm doing this, second year I do the field study, third year I'll build this, fourth year I'll build this. So make it structurized and then seems it's it seems like you are mastering what you're gonna do and then it's time-wise, it's, it's uh, reasonable or feasible. So you really have to make your master plan really detailed uh, so that the professor know what you're going to do during your before, during, and after, right? So yes, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, not that mm -hmm. not that not detail detail, but if you can make that details, it will be impressive. Okay. And then at you least have at least you have like, like a, a plan. Just at first least you plan. are outstanding compared to different uh, 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 applicants. Okay. Okay, so, so that's let's say you have three applicants, and then oh, this guy have a, a nice plan. It's good. Okay, maybe we can go with that. Okay, Sorry. okay, great tip. Uh, you've mentioned about master's uh thesis that you use it as a sort of a pu publication or a paper for your to 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 apply for a PhD. So, uh, I I saw that uh, there's a questions because um. You've mentioned that you, of course, you graduated from a, a master's degree from the Netherlands, but it's not uh, really mandatory that you have to graduate it from uh, the Dutch university and then you can apply for a PhD vacancy. Because someone asks, uh, what if, if they graduated from a master's degree in Indonesia? How, uh, I mean, what is the maybe... Is it attractive enough uh, for, for uh, prof Dutch professor to, to look into your um, backgrounds uh, rather than only uh, from from where you are uh, graduated from? Yeah, I think um, uh, interesting. <laughs> I, I try to address this. Uh, of course, I have many Indonesian colleagues here. Groningen is one of the most uh, I mean, like most of Indonesian students are studying in, in Hraningan. So I don't think uh, your master university, whether it's Indonesia or abroad, will be matter. I don't I don't think it's it's a problem. Um, of course, they will see, I think they will try to see who you are and what's the quality of you or what quality of us. Mm -hmm. That's important. And it reflected through your motivation statement, reflected to your, what is it, uh, research proposal and curriculum vitae. For example, like for the CV motivation statement, if you want to apply for a job PhD vacancy, like academic transfer or maybe somewhere else, usually they gave some background, right? Like a very short introductions, what we are doing and what we expect to do. Then try to, uh, what is it, adjust the CV and motivation statement and your proposal towards that vacancy. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's very, very important because if you're writing something very different, then of course it's not a match. There's a, there's a supply, there's a demand. So it's, it's about how to manage or to fix this or make a fixing this gap, for example. Um, no, I don't think the background is matter. Um, for sure, you can always apply. Um, again, it's, it's during the interview. I think during the interview, you really have to be convincing, let's say. That shows that you're able or capable to do. So they are trying to find someone that could be collaborate with, and we can work together and can make any progress and know the strength. And you also know your your weakness, and you would love to learn to improve that weakness. That's my opinion. Yeah. Okay, that's great uh, input. I think um, it doesn't matter what kind of topic that uh, I mean it, it is matter but in the end during your journey uh, of applying to a PhD program uh, you also have to um, be aware that uh, your research topic could be different from what you uh, applied before right so during your interview sometimes uh, the professor could might point you to another direction or maybe give you some more inputs to exactly. to uh to improve your um plan for example exactly and i noticed that working experience by me doesn't really matter 
because mm -hmm. I met a lot of the PhD here, PhD students, they just first graduate from master. Oh, They've yeah. never worked at all. Even they apply for the PhD position when they are doing their master and expecting their, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, graduation. So if you're you, if you have no working experience, don't worry too much because a lot of uh, people here that I met, even they surprise when they ask me, how old are you? And I said, like, mm -hmm. I'm as old as you are. I'm 28 with 10 years experience. So, so they're kind of surprised because isn't it too late to do the PhD? So for us, somehow for Indonesian, especially for civil servant, it's a little bit later because we have to work and then we have different contract at home. But if you're just first graduate from master, go for it. If you really want to do the PhD, just go to apply. That, that's not a consideration about working experience at all. Yeah, so that's very interesting because a lot of people, um, uh, yeah, they, they kind of have the impression that if you want to do a PhD program, you have to have a academic background. I mean, academia background where you maybe uh, be a lecturer or working uh, for a university, for example. So I think that's misinterpreted as, uh, you know, to, to apply it. To, to pursue a PhD program in the Netherlands, oh, good, at least. Yeah, that's a very good point by Amy, because sometimes uh, during the faculty, on, on the faculty, they expect you to teach as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have experience on teaching or maybe as a teaching assistant during your master degree, that could be a plus. You, have, you don't yeah. have to be a teacher, teacher or lecturer, lecturer, but you have yeah. experience as a teaching assistant, then you can also apply. And or maybe if they ask you during interview, are you willing to teach or not? Then you can say, oh, like, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's also, yeah, do, are you willing to teach us uh, as well? And like, well, because here in Groningen, you know what? When I start teaching, I've never teach in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when <laughs> I start, you when have, they ask me, you work yes, for when, BPS, yes, yeah. I work for the BPS. And then they ask me, hey, Echo, would you like to help us? So they're very polite. Uh, would you like to help us to teach this course? And then at the time, I just start my PhD seven or eight months. And then like, oh, that's a good opportunity for me like to learn. And then they prepare, there's a course in Groningen, start mm -hmm. to teach course. So they train us to teach before we really teach. That's also a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid. And then three months I was prepared and then learned how to teach. And then after that, they even built the syllabus, built the curriculum and everything, being the task uh, theme of the, uh, the course. And then, yeah, that's, that's a very amazing experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, de it depends as well. Uh, I've learned from uh, our previous speakers, uh, for, for example, by a lot from I your colleague as well, but also from uh, other colleagues from uh, Utrecht University, they uh, share the similar um, experience as you, where if you uh, applied for a job vacancy at a university, uh, they perhaps have a already a, a contract for you to, to do a, uh, maybe... Uh, 20% of your yeah. uh, PhD you have to teach, for example, yeah. or if, if you don't have the skills to do so, you can also uh, follow a course uh, or join a workshop, for example. So it's, exactly. it's possible. Okay. Okay. Exactly. And also yeah, maybe, you want to add? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, maybe one thing by any, if you really, if you're a lecturer and if you really like to pursue academic career in, in the Netherlands or in, in Indonesia or everywhere, this is a good opportunity. Once you're here in the Netherlands mm -hmm. and they offer you for teaching, you can apply for a quali like a course like BKO, I forgot, is in Dutch. So there's a qualification for teaching. Mm. So it's like six months and the university paid for you and it's expensive, really, really expensive. Okay. So your university could pay for you. And then after you graduate, you have this uh, certificate, let's say, as mm -hmm. a lecturer, and then you can teach in any university in the Netherlands or in Europe. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, yeah. great information. All right. Uh, coming back to the publication, yeah. someone asked about how many paper or publications that you have to write during your PhD. Is it actually mandatory or not? It's mandatory because uh, when I started PhD, so we call it training and supervision plan in the beginning. So what I had to do within four years. So in terms of courses, I have to fulfill 30 ECTS, uh, European Credit uh, standard okay. something yeah I, I forgot the the complete the transfer system, ECTS? Transfer system. Yeah. yes uh, it's not something very difficult to uh, to achieve actually 
um, it's uh, you attend the courses, you pass the courses, or even you attend the conferences, you attend the workshop, and you get a certificate, and you can also transfer it into ECTS. But for the papers, it's mandatory. So for me, I have to write four uh, papers to be published within four years. And some of the supervisor, they ask um, maybe one full manuscript. Like mm -hmm. maybe you don't have to publish different chapters or different papers, but the full manuscript. But it's rarely happened. During, I, my, during my PhD here, I only met two people doing that. But then after that, everything transferred into a, a paper based. Okay. So, uh, so for the publication, um, my supervisor always said that they said that impact factor is not important. It's not the everything. You can publish everywhere that you feel that this paper will bring the most benefit, the most impact. But again, uh, I remember that I bring their names. Their name is big, <laughs> so I feels like I also have to. I mean, like, I, I respect them. It, they, they didn't ask at all. I mean, like, it's not mandatory. But then there's also a possibility to submit to a good paper. And to be open access is very expensive, mm -hmm. right? And then because University of Running and they have partnership with these journals and also with this publisher, mm -hmm. you can publish open access for free. 2,000 euro, 2,500 euros. There's a lot if you have to pay open access by yourself. But because the university has, um, what is it, like partnership with these big journals and uh, big publishers, you can publish the for free. And if it's open access, of course, almost everyone can access your paper. Easily. So it's actually a good opportunity for you to use this great, uh, yes. great uh, chance you know to to publish as much as articles you want <laughs> actually exactly. if you don't have the time aside from from your um main uh, uh... exactly <laughs> exactly and then once you apply and once your paper published there uh -huh. then you will have new invitations coming to you hey sir i read your paper i would like to invite okay. you to publish to our okay. paper Hi, sir. Would we would like to invite you to be a reviewer? Hi, sir. I would like to. You know, there are many opportunities opportunities okay. open yeah. based on this thing, and uh, and to be honest, it's, of course, it's not easy. But I even didn't expect I can make it. I could make it, but my supervisor helped me a lot. I just asked to them, and then like because they have this level of professionalism and expertise and experiences, so they know what's the weaknesses and what's the strength of my paper. So when it goes to the journal publications or submissions, mm -hmm. of course I get some feedback, but then it's already filtered by my supervisor first. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Good, good to, to keep in mind. All right. Yes. So just to answer a bit, because someone also while well, uh, asking about publication, asking about uh fellowship as well from Nutik So so we don't actually provide any scholarship for uh phd program why because uh the dutch government doesn't uh, offer any scholarship for this type of program uh as i've mentioned before during my presentation but also uh Masek also a little bit uh, share with you that uh the netherlands offer phd program in the form of uh contract uh in general in most of the universities so that's why they don't uh, provide any scholarships but they do uh but some university they do have a a potential funding for your phd uh other than that uh you are also welcome to contact uh your um prospective uh supervisor or professor to to find uh, through their network, sometimes they have uh, information regarding funding, but also, uh, uh, yeah, another thing is uh, trying to find uh, funding from uh, the government, from the Indonesian government, for example, like LPDP uh, or from MORA, uh, Ministry of um, uh, Religion uh, uh, Affairs. Uh, but also from Budi, yeah, LPDP Budi, from uh, for those of you working as a uh, uh, lecturer at a campus in Indonesia. So those are um, some 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 of the ways uh, to find uh, funding for yourself. I hope that uh, answered your uh, question. So and then uh, we also uh, have questions regarding LOA. Yeah. Because uh, maybe some some uh, audience here 
who just uh, participated in the session, they didn't uh, uh, hear about your story uh, that you got funding from the University of Kronin. Make it, maybe you can give a bit information uh, on how uh, you got the, the, the funding, but also uh, how you got the LOA uh, from, from the vacancy. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. So um, again, flashback in 2018, I did apply for the PhD recruitment day, and then I applied for um, for um, professors at the time, and then I got interview. I got invitation for six interviews, and then based on that, uh, all the interviews, I follow up one by one because each interview or each uh, inter like uh, professor has their own perspective and opinion. And I keep uh, following up some of them, uh, almost all of them. I, I did um, make a further application. I revised my proposals to be more uh, extended and to be more comprehensive. So uh, I received several conditional LOA in the beginning. So I still had to find my own uh, funding. So I, got, so I think that's how we call it, uh, conditional LOA because um, the tuition fee was... Uh, some of them I uh, had to pay some tuition fee. Some of them I was accepted exempted from the tuition fee. But then few months later, because the campus Friesland they opened a new job vacancy, so um they opened two job vacancy at the time, and then they offered me one uh, position, and another position was open to um what is it to other selection, and then at the time I received the uh, unconditional LOA from campus Friesland. Okay, so do you have maybe some tips and tricks on how to uh, create your own uh, research proposal? When you, you you did apply through the PhD recruitment, right? Yeah. And so you have to create your own research proposal uh, proposal. when at that time you don't have any idea, for example, to uh, because you apply to, to so many professors, you got eventually uh, six interviews on one day. Uh, maybe could you give us more uh, yeah, uh, information on that? Yeah, so for the proposal, actually, I at the time, I knew already what I want to learn or what I want to do for the research. So I knew these four professors um, probably could help me to uh, achieve the goals to do this mm -hmm. research. So that's how I wrote the proposal. For example, like I created or I write I wrote two proposals about mobile positioning data, which is now I'm doing until now, uh, until at this moment. And then the other two was about, um, I forgot, I think it's about human development index uh, um, indicators, measuring or fixing a human development index, and then how to relate it to the SDGs. And another one is about e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, because these three things are three topics that really already on my mind. I really want to work on this. But when I had to make a priority, MDD is number one, e-commerce is number two, HDI is number three, because I feel like this topic is, I, I really want to learn how to go from the MPD and also how to analyze and everything. So um, I feel like when it comes to the proposal, I realized for me, when I did the interview, I could explain it much better compared to other two. Uh, for example, like for the uh, for the human development index, I was got interview with a professor from ISS Institute of Social Studies, and then he invited me to the interview. And after the interview, he said, "Like, I really like your proposal, but feels like you are fit better with the IHS. And I know someone professor that can help you and to be your professor, which is actually your previous university." I, exactly. I <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh, the destiny brought me back to Rotterdam. So you know, this, yeah, this, uh, this, this has happened. So the interview, I, I could not really expect what happened during the interview. I just tried to do, uh, I just tried to did my best and um, put the effort and put, um, I don't know, passion, I think, and try to implement. Because it feels like during the interview, when you get the connection, it feels like kind of like discussion somehow. You know, instead of interview, sometimes like, oh, maybe you can do this. Maybe you can change the technique. Maybe you can expand it into Indonesia Netherlands comparison or, you know, this kind of, um, what is it? Like communication also possibly happened during the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, with the other two, uh, with the HR, they said like, uh, I like your CV and we have the proposed, I mean, we have professors that are working about this topic, ABC. 
and then they could not come to Indonesia, but they would like to invite you to come to Nijmegen, and then we can um, you we would like to help you to develop the proposal for two or three months. So I I even have no idea that's possible. You know that I never found that it's also a possibility, but then it happened during the interview. So I feels like we cannot really predict what happened, but then just keep doing the best, and then I don't know then. Um, yeah, put 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 hundred percent, I guess. Okay, so uh, for those who are asking, uh, Mas Eko, uh, Mas Eko is actually got funding from the University of Groningen, mm. and then uh, he actually applied for a, a job vacancy. Though. So that means um, uh, he applied for uh through through a contract uh, in the form of contract, right? Yes. Okay. Is a uh, so, yeah. Yes. Okay. So I hope that's clear for everybody. So if you still have question regarding source of funding, uh, I would recommend to uh uh yeah listening to our uh recordings from uh previous sessions or uh also uh, join our uh next uh, up, up, upcoming sessions. Uh, let's see other questions. Uh. This one is actually interesting, Mas Eko, because someone uh, here, uh, I think Mas or uh, Bapak or Ibu Mirza, uh, yeah. he or she uh, got just been accepted as a new external PhD candidate at Groningen University for the uh, Faculty of Law. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a uh, his first or her first direct online meeting with a supervisor a few days ago and would like to keep in touch with him or her and suggested that they could start working on this research from now on uh is he he or she is situated still in indonesia and doesn't have any scholarship uh and will probably start uh the phd uh for next year uh he or she asked, does this mean uh, that he or she is officially accepted as a PhD candidate at the university because he or she uh, hasn't received any official LOA from the university? The supervisor only informed him or her through email that according to graduate school approval, he or she has been accepted. So according to your uh, experience, Will that be uh, already uh, a confirmation that uh, he or she can start his um, uh, PhD program in the Netherlands? Or is it something that uh, not, um, how do you say? Yeah, you have to, to receive the, the proper LOA from, from the university. Okay. Um... We have a lot of external PhD here in the Netherlands, and mm -hmm. um, like for example, like you are, you are for example, like a lot of people here they are working and also want to pursue PhD as well. And then because uh, doing PhD in the Netherlands, many of them accept uh, accepted the tuition fee, and then you can study for uh, for free actually. Um, my suggestion to Miss or Mister Mirza, I think it's better to contact the graduate school about this, because to be officially in what is it to be accepted as a phd student or a researcher in the netherlands you have to be registered in the system for example like we have hora finita so we have a hora finita like uh, where you start everything and then you have the end uh, when it's going to be the end of the study and you put everything on hora finita so uh, everything was being controlled or being monitored during the system um, I think it's better to contact the, the graduate school or maybe the supervisor to provide the LOA and also um, how to how to be what is it um, to be included in the system because if you're becoming a PhD student or researcher here you'll be involved in many uh, situations like maybe email uh, you will have your own email address you will have access to the library you mm -hmm. will have access to uh, facilities. IT facilities, no matter where you are, because everything is online, you can do your research from everywhere, of course. 
but um, I really think that uh, if you are officially accepted, then you should have access and able to um, access uh, all these uh, facilities. I think it's better to clarify with the graduate school and uh, the supervisor as well, because um, of course, when you have to do your research, you need to access the papers, you need to access the journals. Yeah. And then what if you want to attend, I mean, also about funding, all about financial things. For example, like maybe you want to attend the conferences, maybe there are some budget from the university that you can accept. Because every PhD you have, um, I think especially in the University of Groningen, each of uh, PhD, they have, no matter what the, the status is, you have a PhD budget per year that you can use mm. for courses, classes, schools, conferences. So you can, so you should be in the system, then you can access uh, all of them. Yeah, I would have to agree with this because especially if uh, Bapak or Ibu Mirza uh, hasn't received any scholarship, uh, and yeah. you really need to to receive your LOA first uh, in order to apply for a scholarship. For example, if you're applying for LPDP. Although LPDP, uh, what I've known is that uh, they have two different um, uh, track where you can apply without L LOA and with LOA. But it's always better if you already have your LOA, then uh, there if you join uh, the the previous session of this uh, online series, you know that uh, that you can skip a, a part uh, interview or a task uh, from the LPDP, then you can uh, continue uh, to uh, uh, the, the last step of the um, application of the scholarship. So yeah. I hope that helps as well. Let's um see for other questions. Do you maybe uh, Maseko have some uh questions that you would like to uh, answer? Um. Uh, if not, because we also have some questions regarding uh bringing family to the Netherlands. Is yeah. that something that uh applicable to you as well? Uh, I didn't have family yet. I oh, you don't have the. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but uh, can, that's yeah. fine. Sorry. Uh, but definitely, you can bring family here, mm -hmm. and also, um, I think the university also will help you to apply for the visa for your family members. Mm -hmm. And if you have uh children, you can apply for uh kind to or uh subsidy for the for the children, uh, for a uh, free study uh, for the primary school, I think. So I cannot really answer that, but definitely yeah. you can bring the family. Yeah, so for those who are asking about bringing family, that's uh, totally uh, possible. Uh, but just be uh, sure that you consult with your university first, especially if you would like to apply a uh, uh, visa for them, because sometimes they do offer service to, uh, to apply visa for your uh, family members. But if not, uh, you can always ask them because they always provide uh, information regarding bringing family to the Netherlands. But also uh, for work, uh, also ask uh, if you got funding from uh, a scholarship, for example, uh, always ask the, the scholarship provider um, which uh, budget that you will be covered uh, for your family as well, because that's also important for you. And also whether if you are hired by the university that means that you have a, a working permit it also means that your spouse uh, would have a similar status as yours so you uh, your spouse you can also have a um, um, yeah uh, a way to, to, to find a job uh, in the Netherlands as well but please also consult this uh, um, situation to your university and scholarship provider I hope that's uh, answer your question, uh, Can I have a bit about it? Yes, please. So, yeah, so if you like to bring your spouse and they want to work here in the Netherlands, that's really, really uh, possible as my Amy mentioned, but I would like to give some advice or tips if you have time or your wife or husband have time to learn Dutch in Indonesia, mm -hmm. that would be uh, helpful because here, um, even though people are speaking English, but when it comes to apply for a job, they expect that you can speak uh, Dutch. Mm. Because okay. if you don't speak Dutch, I think it's a little bit difficult to find a job for, for your spouse. But if you speak a little bit Dutch, they will be, they will be great. 
Yeah. Okay, great addition to to that. Uh, maybe also depends on what type of work that the, the spouse oh, yeah, is uh, applying for, right? Exactly. But uh, anyway, it's always uh, yeah a good addition to to learn uh, Dutch language. Um, another that uh you've mentioned before regarding facilities at your university. Uh, yes. so someone asking about uh, oh actually this question is coming from Mas Ari as well. Uh, regarding the uh, library and journal access. So what type of facilities that you received so far uh, during your PhD program? And did you also have opportunity to, uh, for example, attend conference? Uh, you, you've mentioned about conference, but maybe there's certain conference that you can uh, attend, but some yeah other conferences you cannot attend, for example. So maybe you can give more um, insights about that. Sure. Uh, facilities. Oh my God, I cannot really count it. <laughs> that is a lot. It is a lot. Okay. Uh, first of all, I got a laptop. I got a screen. So um, of course I have to return them after I finish my study. But I got a laptop. I got a screen, and then what else? Um, headphone. And then if you prefer to have a chairs or tables working space at home during the COVID, you could also have that. But mm -hmm. if you prefer to work from the campus, you could also have that at the campus. So um, because during COVID and until now, we in Groningen implemented hybrid work from home like two days or three days. So you can choose. But mostly I work from uh, office because uh, it's not just five minutes walk from my house. Uh, that's the physical, and then of course you have access, unlimited access to a lot of journals, uh, library funding. Uh, so we have the budget, uh, yearly budget to attend conferences, courses, workshops, winter school, summer school, buying books, whatever. So we have to really, the budget is not that big actually. Uh, it's it's okay. So if you want to attend some conferences, then it should be approved by the supervisor. Is it a good conference or not? Is it impactful or not? And if it's quite far, for example, like I did attend a conference in Canada uh, two months ago. Canada is quite far and it's quite expensive. And then I had to save a lot of things before, right? Because I only have limited budget. Mm -hmm. So we learned about budgeting as well during the PhD. And thanks for the COVID. Oh, sorry to say this, but because of the COVID, <laughs> I attend a lot of online courses, which is... I didn't have to pay at all almost for two years. So I could really save my budget for a big, big conference, the World Statistics Congress. That is that, that is something that I really want to be there. I want to present my, um, uh, what is it, my research in front of the, uh, what is it like, um, the audience, which is really working on the statistic, official statistics, mm -hmm. uh, for example. So you have to be very, very careful to choose the conferences. Sometimes your professor or supervisor will address or take you to the conference that they have or they know it's a good conference. Mm. Okay, maybe, hey, Amy, maybe you can attend this one in Milan. Hey, Amy, maybe you can go to this one in UK because this is a very good conference. You can find potential collaborators there or maybe you can find a potential, I don't know, um, uh, networking over there. So it always has to be approved and discussed with the supervisor. And then other than that, um, yeah, I think that's about the budget and also um, IT, of course, you have an external disk or external working space. And if you're working in the life science field, of course, you can access the lab laboratory and also maybe access for the virtual reality um, facilities, a high speed internet, high speed computer those kind of things. If you're working about big data, machine learning, AI, virtual reality, IoT, Internet of Things, you have Center of Information Technology. They have a very plenty of big facilities that, that, you, that you can uh, uh, access. If you're working with the GIS, geospatial thing, th there are access into the satellite data, and also you can uh, you can work with that. So many, many facilities. Depends on what your research all about. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of facilities, yeah. Okay. So that's actually a lot of um, um, yeah, features that you can take, but of course, uh, it depends on your budget and your university as well, right? Um, yes, but for the facilities of university, like the GIS, satellite data, and also the high-speed computer and everything, that's for free. 
Oh yeah, that's already part of your um, part of program. Us. Yeah, part as your program. as work working as a academic staff uh, at the university. Yeah. Yes, and I think one more advantage by Amy is the networking mm -hmm. with the other oh, yes. industry. The networking is very very crucial because University of Groningen they have many many events mm -hmm. related the industries with business enterprises manufacturing industries so they have a lot of workshops or con not conferences but like meeting industrial meetings so you can showcase what you're doing and then if there are some fact uh, company interested in your research they can reach you out they can hire you they can make a contact with you they can make collaboration with you i think this one call of um, what is it industrial and education networking is something that is invaluable so are those meetings are uh, generally uh, held being held in the Netherlands or also outside the country? Um, offline, in, online, uh, or maybe online. hybrid? Offline. It's offline. Usually it's offline. It's really offline like in the Netherlands. One to one meeting. It's it's really one to one meeting. Yeah. Oh, one to one. Um, okay. One to not one to one. Like uh, offline meeting. It's not hybrid meeting. So you really have to talk with them. Sometimes you can present your poster. Some your products, some your research uh -huh. products. So I'm um, like, yeah, it's like showcasing what you're doing. And for me, I attended Open Data Science uh, meeting. So this is mm -hmm. Open Data Science uh, community in the Netherlands. So it's not only in in the north or Groningen, but also from other provinces. So we are meeting each other, and then we, uh, I present some short presentations, and then we have discussions, and then yeah. So it's it's kind of kind of like, I would like to say facilities that is um, beneficial as well. Okay. Great, interesting, very interesting. So uh, just before we continue, uh, Maseko, because we already, uh, uh, yeah, it's 7.23. <laughs> I don't know if you still want to uh, answer questions. Uh, maybe we can add more seven minutes to make it sure. 7.30 uh, here in Indonesia time. Is that no okay problem. with you? Yes. Because, yeah, okay, that. Uh, Let's see. Um, oh, yes, th this is also interesting. Uh, how, uh, someone asking about uh, a res response from a supervisor during their, I, I guess, uh, when they are still applying to a PhD program. How long does it take to, to, yeah, to get a response? after you send in a research proposal or, for example, applying for a job vacancy at the university? Uh, for, the job, for the job mm -hmm. vacancy, they have the deadline, of course, because, mm -hmm. for example, like, there are some deadlines and then they will you will get the responses right after, like uh, one week or two weeks or three weeks. That's for the job vacancy. Mm -hmm. But for, to approach a professor to be your uh, potential supervisor, it, Probably it takes a little bit longer. Uh, I didn't have experience, honestly, about that because I I, I got my supervisor from PhD recruitment day, mm -hmm. so it's uh, it's a little bit quite faster. Like the process is quite uh, is quite uh, quick, but based on the experiences of my colleague, it's uh, around one or two months, um, one month or two months. But I would like to suggest if you want to approach the supervisor or potential supervisor, I think it would be wise not to mention about funding first. Mm. I think it's nice for you to like, okay, I'm going to try to do this research and then I'm interested in your uh, background and your expertise and then how you could help me and then we can collaborate, something like that. But then once they back to you, whether interested or not, then you can respond with the funding. Mm, okay. Like, for example, like, oh, I'm trying, because there's some cases, I think it's, it's a very nice, good, uh, good gesture. And then it feels like, you know, this, this is just a good gesture. Like, okay, I, I really want to approach you. You want to be a professor. And then and then, and then, then we, we'll see how it goes from there. So I think it would be nice to receive, uh, talk about the funding once they get. Yeah, unless they ask you first, maybe during the interview. Unless they ask you first, do you have, a, I'm interested, do you have a funding or not? So maybe that's, that's also a question. Or maybe this is a very interesting topic. We are having a project at this moment. Maybe you are interested to join our project, yeah. you know. So there are many possibilities because when we are here, when we are here, then I know that many projects they are doing, and then for that project, grants from Horizon Horizon Europe 
or Marie Curie or many consortium, then they need a PhD student mm. to do that. So maybe they don't have opened the faculty yet, but they already have some project in front of them. Then when you approach them, then there's a possibility, okay, this is a very good topic, this is in line, then I would like to approach you to, to be the to be the part of the team. That's also possible. Okay. Yeah. Uh all right. That's uh thank you for your answer, Maseko. No um Oh, coming back to to um your academic background, uh, yes. if for example, because you said that um as a fresh graduate from master degree, you can always apply directly to a PhD program, right? You don't really yes. need to have a uh, academic background or as a lecturer, for example. Uh, so is it really matter with the GPA? Uh, with the scores that you receive from your master's rookie, does that uh, um, scores influence the, de the decision of the professor to accept you as a PhD candidate? Uh, yes and no. Hmm. So I think um, for the GPA, of course, for the PhD, because it's academic career or academic position, of course, I mean, like logically, you have to have a strong academic background. And how strong is that? It's, of course, relative. Mm -hmm. I would like to say around 3, maybe, or 3.2. Um, for okay. Indonesian. For Indonesian yeah. grade, Great. I think. Yeah, because the scale was 4, right? Yeah, yes. the scale was 4, 0 to 4 for the bachelor. And then for the master, I don't know, because I graduated from the Netherlands, then I had the grade from the Netherlands. And, mm -hmm. you know, my Amy, when I did my master, mm -hmm. I said, like, it, it was impossible to be cum laude. <laughs> because it's so <laughs> but it's so hard to, to get a perfect score in the Netherlands for those exactly. who ask. <laughs> uh, so it's I mean like this for me because I'm not that smart. So maybe it's gonna be different <laughs> compared to other colleagues or my our, our attendees. But um I tried that my academic is enough when I had to apply for the PhD. Mm -hmm. So like seven, seven point five. And then I'm trying my best to be above that. Like I try to be above seven point five, maybe a little bit below. Uh, because cum laude in Netherlands was eight, is eight, so I'm trying to approach that level. So at least I pass the administration first, mm -hmm. and then when it comes to the selection, uh, based on what I learned here, not I learned, but I saw, when you have several candidates goes to the interview, four people, five people, then they will see who's outstanding ac academically. Oh, this one is cum laude, and this one is maybe not cum laude. Then probably it's going to be a little bit consideration. But again, it comes to, again, with your proposal and how you defend your methods or your research during the interview, and they see who could uh, perform better. So it's yes or no, but if, you don't, if you're not cum laude like me, don't worry, just apply. <laughs> uh, but as, at least uh, the score is proficient enough to apply. Okay, so it is one of the factors of uh, decision making, but it's not completely the final decision yeah from from the gpa i, I don't think so yeah okay so i hope that answer your question um okay so uh, i'm looking at the questions uh most of the questions actually have been answered so for those who are just joined this session uh, mm -hmm. Please uh, feel free to refer to the recording so you can always uh, um, yeah, learn a uh, story from Mas Eko regarding uh, his um, PhD journey. Uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, answer one more question. Sure. I think there's a question about biomedical science. Uh, mm, is that the one? Oh, the, the last one? The last one. Uh, do you have some recommended university related to my role as a lecturer in biomedical sciences related to human anatomy and histology? Is there a big chance for me to pass the requirements even we are in the... Uh, even uh, maybe he or she... Uh, uh, graduate, graduated from an Indonesian university. Okay, yeah. so do, do you have some uh, inputs for this? 
Yes, I think from so. From the University of Groningen. You can go to University of Groningen. Uh, we have the Faculty of UMCG, Universiteit Medisch Global Center of Groningen. Uh -huh. It's Groningen. It's also a good one, but I think the best is in Amsterdam. Uh, yeah. University of Amsterdam is one of I think number one is Amsterdam, and then Groningen, and then Rotterdam. So maybe you can check UM, uh, Universiteit Medical Center. Then you can see. I think Amsterdam have. Groningen have, Maastricht have, Rotterdam also have. Yeah, yeah uh, Rotterdam has a, what is it called? Uh, Erasmus, Erasmus MC. MC, yeah. EMC, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. EMC, EMC, right. But yeah, um, yeah for uh, maybe just to, to give you some uh, advices uh who for those who are still looking for um university or a uh, field of study you can always uh try from the study finder uh from uh, our website study in nl it's actually a database for bachelor uh, masters and short course but it helps for phd candidates why because you can find uh, which university uh, that, that actually offers uh, the study programs that you would like to um, do a, a research. So from there, you can uh, continue your research uh, through visiting the website because uh, uh, most of the websites, they have their own PhD uh, webpage where you can find more information regarding pro the program, but also uh, the contacts, uh, sometimes they have PhD coordinator uh, contact details, sometimes they have their own contact details of their faculties. Uh, so from there, you can always start your, um, uh, yeah, uh, contact uh, to, to the supervisor or to your uh, intended professor. But always, it also always better to, to, to do your own research first, which professor that you would like to uh to be in contact with <laughs> at least you know that what kind of publications that they have or exactly. is it really uh resonates with your topics or not um exactly. if yeah. yes it it is more likely that uh they they interest with your uh research topic for example Okay, uh, I think we can wrap up these questions because uh, I'm afraid that <laughs> Mas Eko is being, I don't know, I think you need to, to get some rest, yeah, Mas Eko? <laughs> well, um, I, I, I will continue some work at this moment. I'm, I'm working from campus, so uh, after this I will continue because it's not yet weekend here, so I yeah. envy you. <laughs> yeah, it's still yeah. Uh, afternoon, yeah, but... Yes. Um, but anyway, so um, uh, just last, maybe last uh, to, to wrap up the session, maybe you can give us some tips and tricks, uh, Maseko, or some encouraging uh, message to the our prospective PhD candidates. Maybe they will come to Groningen or other university in the Netherlands. Yes, um, choose your topic wisely because four year of study of the PhD is not always easy. It's up and down. And you could find a lot of memes, memes, memes <laughs> about that. So um, if you are doing, I think based on my experience, um, if you are doing something that we, we really want to do, then no matter how difficult the obstacles, we, we can start to manage and navigate things. And also uh, cultural, uh, we have to try to integrate as well to be more open and if we have problems, don't wait until the problems becoming bigger and approach the supervisor as soon as possible because they are here not as, this is egalitarian, we have the same position. They, they always said that. They said that I'm not here to judge you, I'm here to supervise you. So sometimes in Indonesia, we feel like very hierarchical, but here it's a little bit different. So, so yeah, try to be more open, to be more communicative and then hopefully, uh, we can manage the, I think one of the Q&A, how to manage the stress. So at least the stress, what the supervisor <laughs> could be solved. 
So yeah, keep 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 positive and keep um keep our mental health uh balance and healthy. Yeah. Uh health mental is very important. So very important. Yeah, just as <laughs> you uh shared before that uh, they really uh concern with your uh well being in the Netherlands. So it's very uh interesting to hear as well. So uh thank you very much, Maseko, uh thank for you, being uh, here and sharing your uh, stories as well as your uh experience as a um PhD researcher. Uh would like to wish you all the best with your um uh final um defense uh thank in the so upcoming much. weeks and hopefully you'll get the, the degree soon and uh, we'll keep in Good touch class. yes yes <laughs> thank you. Uh, if you'll be in indonesia just let us know if you want to meet and then uh, maybe we can find you at an alumni event here in indonesia oh, that, would, that would be nice yeah, yeah. And for uh, the participants here, uh, thank you very much for joining us until this uh, very end of the session. Uh, really nice to have your questions, but uh, really sorry as well for those who uh, questions that has not been answered before. But feel free to send us an uh, email to our uh, sea.info at nufik.nl so we can um, answer your questions. Uh, but if you also have questions to Mas Eko uh, after this, uh, we can also uh, send it to, to Mas Eko, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, so uh, after this, uh, we still have a lot of um, online series. So just keep uh, uh, updated through our social media channels. Uh, we, we will be having a, a lot of uh, updates uh, regarding the PhD recruitment as well for the Dutch delegates. So if you do applying for the PhD recruitment, uh, just keep, keep an eye on uh, on our social media. And don't worry, we will uh, also uh, upload this session to our YouTube channel, uh, Nutrix Southeast Asia. So you can always uh, refer back to the recording. So uh, thank you very much again, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. And have a good uh, day for Maseko. You too, my Amy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, my Amy. Have a nice weekend. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.